So hello everybody. Uh, my name is Adel Gituni. I uh, would like to start first by acknowledging the territory. Um, we acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen speaking people on those traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and uh, Osanich uh, peoples who historical relationship with the land continue to this day. So to start uh, this webinar, I would like to start with the first question and first poll. So if applicable to you, uh, what do you think happened to your business? Uh, did your business boom or decline or as usual? So waiting for uh, maybe a few answers. Okay, one. So according to uh, to this, and I guess uh, we can show um, um, the result. Um, so. Many of you consider that the business is declined. Uh, for 37%, it is as usual. And only about 11% consider that the business has boomed. And uh, that is true because if you think about it and uh, if you have experienced the problem of the, the toilet paper rolls, um, uh, a lot of demand has increased um, in, in uh, some businesses. Um, and anything related to uh, health, anything related to consumable and so on. Uh, and we have seen this increase of business. Other businesses and here, uh, I, I'm, I'm using the, the meat, the packaged meat because uh, we had these uh, news worthy stories coming from uh, some plants who have been affected by COVID-19, but most of the co consumption that we still actually having, there was some fluctuation, but actually, uh, many businesses have seen their business steady. And um, other businesses, they have declined. And think, think about uh, the hospitality services, think about transportation, especially the air transportation and so on. Um, interestingly enough, um, this is, is old. It uh, was published in March, but it shows how um, COVID-19 impacted the way how we work. And according to the study that was done up to the end of March, uh, Canada has seen an increase in productivity from or using the remote working or working from home. Uh, all the countries ar around the world have seen some kind of increase in remote working uh, and using um, uh, home spaces for working. So when you start thinking about it as well, this is now we are able to use uh, our, our houses um, in a way how we can really, how we contribute to, uh, to businesses. Um, I pro you probably have seen this in the news and these were big stories in the news. So uh, the pandas and, and uh, um, the fact that the zoo in Calgary um, ship it back uh, the pandas to China because they were not able uh, to um, secure the supply of bamboos, um, PPEs and the personal protective equipment and all what is going on around the health supply chain was always on the news and it has completely changed the way how we look at the supply chains. You remember um, Trump's decision to uh, limit the export of um, the N35, uh, the, the masks to Canada, um, people in China or countries in China were hijacking supplies of medical uh, uh, equipment on the tarmac. Aircrafts in the in the in the sky have been hijacked by different countries, uh, where actually the the supply was uh, this uh, destination was to different countries. And I, I I don't I'm not sure if you heard about France complaining about the U.S. Uh, hijacking uh, a shipment to France or Tunisia complaining that Italy has hijacked uh, uh, a tanker of, of alcohol that was directed to Tunisia. Um, but one of the biggest also story that we, we should brace ourselves for is 
the complexity and the challenges with the supply chain for manufacturing and distributing the vaccine when it will be ready. Um, so the common uh, element between all of these stories is supply chain. And you heard it in the news or for many people, um, this was kind of um, discovery to it is supply chain. For other people, they have known it all, all along and they have a perspective to that kind of supply chain. So I would like to use what they call the value creation out of value chain perspective. And for some of you, uh, sometimes you don't really see what is the difference between supply chain and value chain. So let's start with the firm or a business. And this is the simplest kind of model I can come with. Um, a firm exists or a business exists because there is a customer somewhere willing to pay for a product or um, a service or an idea or an information or a study. So in that process, so the firm to be able to meet that demand, we create what we call actually a bridge between the business and the customer. That bridge could be uh, in, in this particular case, what I call the out, outbound logistic, for example, if you're thinking about products that will be delivering and so on. But it is also true when I'm delivering, for example, this webinar, I need to have a connectivity and so on. So even actually the smallest thing, uh, sending an email and so on, you need actually to build connections with that customer. That will also help you building another type of bridge about information sharing and exchange and feedback and so on. But when we are dealing with um, uh, especially products and services, you need also to build the return. So that is what is the simplest view of how a firm creates value or a business value. And here I'm talking about business uh, because if you are not really selling, if you're not getting paid for that, you are not a business. You could be any type of other organization. But the same idea works here. So now, this is the time for my next polling question. So if you think from that perspective about this value creation, can you think about any uh, process that is self-sustained or self-sufficient, sorry? Another five seconds and we'll, okay, so I'm gonna end the poll and you are able to see the polls as they are coming because I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my screen here. And 80% uh, of you are saying no and 20% saying yes. And for the 20% at the end of this presentation, you will have my email address. I want you to email me with those examples of businesses that you consider self-sufficient. And the answer, at least based on what I have been studying so far, the answer is no. It's very, it's unless actually we, we simplify things to the maximum, but any business exists, sorry, any business exists um, in relationship with others. And I'm using this simple story. This is actually uh, was published in 1958 about it's called the story of the pencil or a pencil. And what is describing it is describing this process where you have thousands of people, they don't know each other and sometimes they may even kill each other that they are collaborating in making this simple product that we call a pencil. And when you think about it, um, uh, someone like um, um, uh, so the, some of the economists um, and um, used this example in the past to be able to say all of this complexity of this value creation can be captured by something like the price and we can use the supply and demand to be able to study the complexity of the system. So I will go back and revisit this kind of ass uh, assertion, but the point is Unfortunately, there is no business that can exist if they by itself. And this is why at least you need to start thinking about who are your suppliers and your supplier could be even um, the suppliers that are providing you with the computer that you are using, because again, you need to buy the computer in order to be able to deliver that service, or you need to think about the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the sustaining your, your business. Uh, the same thing actually for the customer. And, 
And in supply chain, we try to create different tiers of suppliers. So there are some suppliers who your business depend on them. They are so vital that you cannot exist as a business if you do not if you you don't have those suppliers. Some other suppliers could be at arm's length. You can really go and buy the stuff that you need from any place. So you need paper, you need pencils, you need whatever. So those type of suppliers do exist. Yes, they are important. Yes but they are not so critical to the delivery of that value. And that is the process of value adding. So, uh, and you can see now you start really building this across the system, then you start understanding the complexity of the networking and the relationship that we build when we are creating this system of system. And when we are thinking, why is it when we had this pandemic, for example, like some countries, they were able to get the supplies and other not, and what kind of relationship played into sustaining those supply chains. So now I have another poll question. And the question is, if you think about this value creation process, um, can you think about um, what are the most important engines that drive that value creation process? So it could be the capital, the labor, the knowledge, the technology, all of them, none of them. This one is a little bit uh, more complicated. I'm giving you a little bit more time. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll here. And these are the results. So, um, so you see, again, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really happy that none uh, decided that the last answer is correct. So. Um, and, and you see a little bit of distribution there between uh, capital, labor, knowledge, and technology, uh, but the majority went for um, the all of the above. And, and the, I, again, some, for some, for a long time, we have thought that the capital is the main engine for business because again, you, if you have the capital, you can buy technology, you can pay people to work for you, you can access knowledge and, and, and so on. Uh, but we discovered, so for example, if you take the, the, the pandemic right now, um, we discovered that um, the, uh, for example, if I go back to the meat and, and the packaging of meat in, 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 um, in, those, pa in those plants, um, we were at, we started really having a problem and, and one of the issue that was on the news is the ability to be able to supply the Canadian market with uh, packaged meat uh, when we had these outbreaks, outbreaks in these, um, in these plants. So if we are, if we, even if we had all the money of the world and, but we are not able to get people to work, then we cannot deliver that value. Think about ideas and, 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 and knowledge. So we have this idea that we can buy ideas, so we can buy the knowledge. Uh, but once I shared my idea and my knowledge with you, there is no transfer of property, even though that we can actually bring the idea of the uh, intellectual property and so on. But still, I, when I leave the meeting, in that transaction of exchanging knowledge, you did not leave with my knowledge. I still have my knowledge and I can use it in other places. So an idea plus an idea is not equal to two ideas. It could be three ideas. It could be multiple ideas. So this idea that the money and we can monetize the knowledge is a very dangerous and very difficult kind of one. The same thing actually for the technology. Yes, you can go and buy technology, but you cannot necessarily innovate in the technology. So technology is also a very important, you can see uh, the displacement that technology is creating in the job market and in the economy. So I came to, to this conclusion that we cannot, so it, the best way to start thinking about the value creation, and especially when you, when you take it from my perspective, operations management supply chain, you have to consider the four engines at the same time. You cannot really assume that you can reduce any one of those engines to one to the other saying, okay, because we can monetize everything. So everything would be measured in terms of money. The other dimension to, to my talk about this value creation is 
in this value adding process, when I started looking at what we mean about value, uh, many, in many cases, actually, we try to monetize the value and saying it is like the economic value. Uh, but if you look at the literature recently, um, and not just even recently, even, even if you go to Adam Smith, value means different things to different people. For example, Adam Smith is talking about the value in exchange and value in use. So when you start thinking about value, what I found is people are talking about value, but they have difficulty to define what is the value. So we actually measure the value through a number of attributes. And fortunately, until like recently, and most of the economics theories, we have actually tried to reduce that economic values into financial values. So it's really the financial, and that's how we measure the GDP as an example. Um, but very quickly we discovered that no, that is dangerous because reducing the social dimensions, for example, or the environmental dimensions to an economic dimension is a very dangerous if we don't do it correctly. And to do it correctly, we don't have necessarily always the tools. So I would prefer to think about multi-attributed values. So the value has multiple attributes. We can assess it differently. And throughout the system, there are multiple stakeholders. So the supplier are different stakeholders. The shareholders are different stakeholders. Um, the owners of the company are different stakeholders. The customers are different stakeholders. Governments are different stakeholders. And for all of these different stakeholders, there are different dimensions of that or different attributes of that value that are really important. So let's take the coffee. And uh, I, I like this one because it's easy and everybody, I guess, not everybody, many people like coffee. So the difference between a value chain and supply chain is simple. So basically imagine that the, the value that you can extract from a cup of coffee. To get to that consumption of coffee and paying for that cup of coffee, you need actually to have this chain. And sorry, this is linear, but the reality is not linear. So you have these different activities that needs to happen by different actors throughout, uh, uh, along this value chain in order for me to go and enjoy my preferred uh, cup of coffee anywhere. Um, so that is what we call a value chain. So that is the different activities that are adding value in order for me to enjoy that cup of coffee. If I represent that from a supply chain perspective, then I would be talking about the different kind of physical entities that are connected and the different kind of logistics and so on that is required in order to move things in the physical world. And, and it is too, it's a lot and it's anchored into the time and space. So, um, and, and the social and the environment and, and everything. So the coffee market or the coffee kind of uh, industry is worth uh, $100 billion. So if you, uh, uh, coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world. And, um, and uh, most of the people that are working in the coffee are people who are poor, do not have um, access. There are millions of families and so on uh, that are working in the coffee uh, system. So if I ask, if we think about that and use now this uh, to talk about resiliency and robustness. So resiliency, think about um, your preferred coffee shop in, on the corner of your street. And um, let's say that before the COVID-19, they were selling, I don't know, on average a thousand coffee per day. And then the cough, the COVID-19 happened and you have what you call a disruption and after that they went actually down so they 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 were not able to sell the thousand coffee that they were able to sell before but because they are on the curb of the street so they came with this idea that they can really uh, you can you can order you can come and pick up your order or they they made maybe agreement with the, skip the dishes and they can deliver the coffee to your house so they did not really shut down completely another company um, another coffee shop, unfortunately, they did not have that same kind of luxury. So they shut down completely. 
And then when we went to phase two and so on, they started really reopening and offering different service. So normal operations, then we have the disruption, we have this kind of now reduced operation, and then we go back, back to normal. These are the five phases of any disruption. So the shock, fluctuation of performance, containment, recovery, and stabilization. And this is why when I say it's the stabilization takes a little bit of time as well. So the resiliency is, so if you look at the red company and the blue company, um, we can say that the blue company is more resilient because first of all, they were able to contain faster, but it is, if you look at the time to recover, it took them less than the red company. So this is, is what means resiliency when you talk about in supply chain. Robustness is a little bit different. So now if we take back again, our two companies, we have the COVID-19 and in this case, I was more kind of generous with the red company. I did not shut them completely. Um, so, and let's say after the COVID-19, we have a surge of demand for these two companies for coffee. And, and that positive disruption now, a surge, think about the, the toilet paper, for example, when you have a surge of demand, uh, that surge of demand is a different kind of disruption. It's a positive disruption. So when you start thinking about the fluctuations between the minimum and the maximum, given all the possible disruptions that we can think about, that will define what are the upper and lower performance limit for the two companies, given the disruption. And that's how we define robustness. So robustness is a structural property of the system. So think about you when you take a flu, the first time you see the virus, it knocks you down for three days. The second time, maybe it's one day. And then the third time, you don't have any, any problem with, with that virus at all. And, and that is what we talk about robustness and don't confuse it with agility, but because that's an, a different concept. So going back to our coffee, and um, if we, we go to this value chain and supply chains, um, there is a problem with this because we have neglected for a long time uh, what happens, uh, what you call the life cycle uh, of this product. So after you finish your coffee, there is the recycling that we need to think about it. Um, there is actually different kind of reuse and so on of the, of, of, of the product. But also in this value chain, there is the contribution of nature that we have neglected for so long. We consider it as externality, we consider it as for granted and so on. So here I just represented the bees, the contribution of bees in pollinating the flowers of the coffee beans. So if I ask you this now, Paul, and saying, how much do you think is the contribution of the bees from an economic perspective to the coffee value chain? Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. And uh, there are 20, so the big majority are saying it is invaluable. And uh, people that are 39% saying that it is 25% and the minority saying it is 5%. So there is, by the way, there is, uh, it's a published uh, economic uh, uh, study uh, that has estimated the contribution of the bees to the coffee value chain to 25%. So if you remember what I said earlier, it's about $100 billion industry. So we should actually pay every year about $25 billion to the bees so they can continue this work. So, uh, but I would prefer to say it is invaluable because if you think about it, if we lose the bees and there are some papers that were uh, published recently about the contribution of bees to the agriculture. And in some kind of crop, it's more than 70% of the, if we, if we lose the bees, the, we, the, the production of the, that crop will co would collapse by 70 to 75%. So if, you, if, I'm, I am, if I have a business in coffee, it is in my interest actually to keep the bees working and to keep them happy doing that work. And this is why when you start really thinking about it from this perspective, 
things will, will take a different, a completely different meaning. So this is why I advocate for really going beyond the adaptation. It's really changing. And to change, we need actually to nest the economy within the society. And we need to nest the society within the environment. So basically, this is an existence skin uh, conditions. So if we lose the environment, there is no society, there are no communities. If we lose the communities, there is no economy. And that should be the way how we should think about these type of problems. And, that, and this is why from the sustainable development goal, this is actually the, the one that I like because it tries actually to replic replicate that nesting structure of how things really work. And I bring you to my last poll. And here Elon Musk is sending you to Mars with $1 billion in paper money. And you would actually keep the money if you come back um, with that money and with the success uh, of your mission. So things go wrong, you are, you are lost in space, you're forgotten there. And my question to you, during those times that you are lost, what is the value of the $1 billion? Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll here. Um, so, and, and this is actually interesting because again, uh, some people think it's still $1 billion and uh, others, they say it's depreciated value, uh, the paper or um, the nothing. And this is an extreme example um, because what I'm trying to get to is the value and this is the danger of monetization the value that we are attributing to things and using actually a monetary basis for that is very dangerous because when we start thinking about the value of a dollar or of any currency or any money, it is in that kind of relationship between people. So if I am alone in the space with no possibility of leaving that situation, uh, the value of the money probably is the paper that is printed on because I can turn it to heat or something else. Uh, but if for the money to really take a value, you need to have another person on the other side in this relationship to be able to appreciate that value and to be able to exchange it with you. So the value of that we are attributing to money is, is what we, it's happening in this social construct. The other thing is uh, less, less extreme than this one. I come from Tunisia originally, and the, the currency of Tunisia is not, is not an international currency. When I leave the country, uh, there is no value to that money that they have, the paper money, if I go to Europe and so on to buy anything with it. I can't. And basically, uh, I can simply maybe buy a seller to someone who's collecting these, these kind of currencies. Um, which actually brings me to these three fundamental uh, uh, fun foundations to what I consider responsible management and decision making. So if we accept the nesting idea and nesting model, so managing for the different stakeholders, accepting that the value has multi-dimensions, it is multi-attributed, and we need to implement a long-term perspective. Those are the three foundations for successful movement. And my assumption, and this is actually the theory I'm trying to develop and work around, is when you start really implementing this in that nested model, that's how you can create resilient and robust value chains. Examples to that Unilever when actually they switched it uh, and they started to introduce their sustainable living brands, even if they are doing it for greenwashing and for, for, for uh, um, uh, just marketing perspective, when they look at, at the value chain, they look at, at all the different dimensions of, uh, for example, here, the greenhouse gas. And, and basically they did not say 61% of our footprint is the responsibility of customers and 29% is um, the suppliers or the, the farmers. So we are good, we are only responsible for 9%, that is not our responsibility. They tried actually to take this, to reinvent these brands and these, these products, considering the end-to-end -end value chain. And that is he created this kind of 47. So these, these brands, these, these products, at 46% faster in terms of growth than the rest of their business. Another one is IKEA. And again, I, don't, I, 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 I criticize IKEA for a lot of things, but this is, is a partnership between a business 
and an NGO in trying to sustain to do, to produce sustainable farming of, of cotton. And this is, is now uplifting more than 110,000 farmers in, in Asia. So it's in Bangladesh and, and Pakistan and so on, which is a fundamental and phenomenal kind of uh, leveraging effect and lifting, lifting people out of poverty. So to finish with, with, with this is uh, we need actually to start thinking in terms of how we create virtual uh, virtuous cycles and these virtual cycles is start to think about this this economy as circular um, we are connected with the society we are connected with the nature and we have to start thinking in the long term and remember that human rights and sustainability travel along the supply chain when apple had the the, the problem with with the with the production of, of iphones in china uh, they blame it in the beginning their supplier, but then when they started really implementing what you call the sustainability responsibility, so that really changed it completely the working condition of many people around the world. So my my recommendation is when you start thinking about upgrading and and improving your business, think about upgrading the culture, how you can start moving from this transactional economy to a relational economy, stakeholder instead of shareholders. Uh, from the single objective to multi-objective, from short term to long term. Think about what are the functions that you need to upgrade in your processes or in your business. Think about the products and how you can really start thinking about what are more responsible lines of products and, and also how you can learn from one value chain to bring it to a different value chain. So thank you. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than uh, the 25 minutes I planned, but uh, happy to take any question or comment. So I have a question here from Melanie saying, on the other end though, doesn't the $1 billion retained value in the negative, Elon Musk has negative 1 billion. Yes, uh, again, if, if, you, if you, but you see now we are getting, uh, if, you, if you use that, um, Elon Musk, by paying the $1 billion to me, he lost that $1 million from his bank account. Um, but that is not the, the question, is really now, if I'm taking that $1 billion, um, what is the value of the $1 billion to me? The other thing that you need to uh, also recognize that we are printing money, and especially if I'm using the US dollar, um, uh, the central bank is printing always money. And sometimes it is printing money out of thin air. Um, now through the COVID-19, most central banks are printing money. So the money is also a commodity if you think about it, and it is produced by these central banks. So attaching things like, for example, the bees, let's say that the bees go extinct. And let's say we get all the central banks of the world to start printing the money to be able to bring back the bees, and especially if we are not able to clone them or whatever, it's, it's gonna be a lost species and a lot of species that we lost that we cannot buy back. Uh, think about your own health. Sometimes you are, people are very, very careful the way how they are managing money, but when they, they, they start really having a health crisis, they are willing actually to spend it all to be able to recover that health. And, and, and that's what I'm trying to say is yes, money, it is a very important tool that we have created to be able to facilitate our trade, our exchange and so on, but it's not the, uh, it's not the only value that we need to value. Okay, Brian, thank you. Sorry, I, uh, how do you anticipate Canada and other countries will modify their supply chains? Um, so uh, specific to the healthcare supplies to a negative future. And, 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 and this is, is a great question, I think, from the perspective how our world became so intertwined. So now if you would like to, to entangle all of these kind of global supply chain, it's gonna be very, very difficult and hard. In my opinion, we will see governments and so on investing a lot in what we call actually the national security and, and we will start maybe rethinking what national security means and what are the critical industries to, 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 to uh, national securities. I th but I don't think that we will see completely going back to nationalism and, 
and and uh, and national industries and so on because um and like and doing the, the this these kind of supply chain is is going to be very difficult and i would i would say impossible and uh, humans we are we have a very short memory so in a few years from now COVID 19 will be something that we look into the mirror and people will forget and go back to to normal so my advice is we have to spot to stop chasing the cheapest supply chain we should stop actually squeezing suppliers for the cheapest kind of product but we need actually to start working with the suppliers from around the world on upgrading these supply chains and these products and moving toward more sustainable and responsible supply chains uh, just to give you an example kpmg which is um, uh, a consulting company um, when BC, they started having a problem with the PPE in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it is KPMG that started using their network, their international network, especially in China, because they do have their offices there to be able to create the connections for the BC government to access suppliers of PPEs from China. So that relationship, going back to my idea about relationship and relationship building and trust and so on, is really important. So thank you for the question. Abdul Halim, uh, in the world there is a free riders problem. So who is going to protect the life of bees? Of a bee? Uh, I think you and I, and this is actually where I would like to, you to remember that the value, especially from a business perspective, is usually appreciated at the consumption point. You as a customer, you as a consumer, if you'd like to use yourself, consumer, I don't like consumer because it, 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 it leads to consumerism. I, I like to use customer. You as a customer, you can make the choices. You can push businesses to move toward these more responsible kind of situation. Yes, governments will come. Uh, there will be regulations, farmers themselves. So with now, the, the, the asymmetry of information now is going toward more of the customer rather than the, um, it was actually dominated by businesses. Now we have access to this information. So people can really pressure businesses and governments and so on, but there should be also uh, regulations to protect these, these bees. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rodrigo, uh, great presentation, thank you. How do you see Canadian companies in terms of implementing circular economy? They are changing linear mindset to a circular one. Uh, I think I think there is, in my opinion, and this is is I am probably naive. I'm optimistic uh, by nature. I think most of the people are people of goodwill, and most businesses, most of the people who are in business and so on, they are in business not necessarily just to make money. Uh, and I haven't seen any mission statement of any business saying we are here to make money. Um, it's more to solve problem. And I think, yes, there are sharks in, in, the, in the business. There are people who are pushing that. But I think most of the Canadian businesses starting to realize the importance of this um, thinking in term, this systematic thinking, thinking about the economy and the society and the environment as a whole, not as a separate removing this idea of externalities and saying externalities responsibility of of um, of government so i think there are the b corp corporation the b corp movement there are many kind of examples of businesses who are moving in that direction but i would say that should accelerate if we we all um, get committed to that um, okay next severe interesting session Dell I agree with the premise that resilience is critical however are these their elements of the world that should be allowed to what yes yes absolutely steer if, if everything um, that existed pre-covid world I absolutely agree and that is now the life the life cycle and I think actually this so there will be businesses that will and this is why I believe um, that this opportunity and everybody is really like uh, stressed out by the COVID-19, but I see a huge opportunity for the world for, for a big reset. There is, there, is, there is opportunity to rethink a lot of things that we took for granted. Um, and I think especially, um, I would say since the 70s of last century, I think we have really went in uh, too much into 
um, shareholder wealth maximization into this extractive type of institution into thinking that the, 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 the natural resources are infinite and limited. This idea that there is no limitation to capitalism and capitalism or, or the, 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 the perfect markets, um, but also there are many businesses that needs actually to, to fade away. And, and I think I, I, I see that would, will happen. And fortunately, I would say, so there is, um, as I said earlier, we have short memory and probably a lot of these issues will be forgotten and maybe in a few years we'll get back to people publishing and pushing the idea of maximization efficiency and so on so thank you for that uh so basma some have blamed globalization for the disruption in the supply chain for ppes uh, with production facility located in only a few countries does this mean that to increase resiliences we need to shift to local supply chain, at least um, for essential products. And absolutely, yes. Um, first of all, when I teach supply chain, I tell, even from a business perspective, a micro, micro uh, level perspective, I tell students that it's really important to have diversification in terms of suppliers. So, so there are different tiers of suppliers. You have tier one, tier two, two, three, whatever you would like to, to structure them. But those suppliers that are really critical to the, to the delivery of your business, you need actually to keep them close to, your, to you, but also you need not to depend on only one because if they go down, you go down. Uh, the same thing actually in terms of geographic diversification. So if you are uh, sourcing only from one region of the world, Think about not COVID-19, think about disaster, climate change, um, piracy, security, other kind of issues uh, will disrupt that. So you need actually to build that kind of diversification. Does it mean that we need to go all the countries to start really building that in, in nationally? I think that would be wrong. But you need actually to start really building that diversification, which also pushes toward a smaller type of, of, of suppliers because these the, these measures immersion and acquisition and getting to these kind of huge companies uh, that are too big to fail uh, I think is it's also another danger so we need to be careful about that so yes absolutely it is part of the diversification that you start building resiliency and robustness in your system uh, G thank you for so much for the inspiring talk thank you G uh, could you please speak a little more regarding factors that help build more resilient supply chain? I think I touched some of it. So uh, when you start about resiliency, I, I like to use the human body and say, look, um, if you would like to resist to, to these kind of whatever uh, viruses and so on, you need to build some kind of your immune system. And resiliency is about that, how you can build the immune system. So. So, so we, in supply chain, if we, we look at it from the high level, there are three types of uncertainties. There is the demand uncertainty, there is the supply uncertainty, and there are the internal uncertainties. So the combination of the three together will add up. So basically, if you have demand uncertainty, supply uncertainty, and internal uncertainty, absolutely you are at high risk. So now how you can work on these different uncertainties. Suppliers, I think I, I give examples of diversification could be an idea. Uh, customers, fidelization, work with your customers, trying to build, uh, integrate what they call actually building your customer relationship uh, systems, how you connect with them, but internally. And internally, I would like, at least especially us in business school, we stop just teaching things about money. Many businesses were not able to start because they did not have the right people. And if you start really empowering people, you will see how good they are. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just link to something I have done in the past. So when you think about something like the aircraft carrier, and I'm sorry for those who don't really like military, aircraft carrier you have about 5,000 people working on, those, on, that, on that carrier and you have like thousands and thousands of systems. The probability for that system to be reliable is very low. And the only way that that system is working and it is reliable because of the people who are working on the aircraft carrier. And that is what we need to remember. It's not the money. 
Because again, you could have the money, but you are not able to, to find the turnarounds around it. So internally, start with the people, the knowledge, technology, and the money. Um, okay, sorry, I kind of lost a little bit here. Okay, so uh, Sarvish, sorry if I, I'm not really spelling your name correctly, but uh, what are some of the improvements and developments in the supply chain due to COVID-19? Um, I think there are a lot, and, and basically one is recognizing uh, the human dimension, building trust and so on, digitization and starting to build more, more visibility, traceability, um, uh, including the artificial intelligence, the, uh, uh, the, the reasoning, trying really uh, to connect more and, and trust systems between each other. I think that is, is coming. Uh, diversification, I think you will see a lot of startups and so on, where people are trying to rebuild uh, some capacity in some countries. You will see it in the US, you see it in Canada and other kind of European countries. Uh, rethinking what is um, part of the national resiliency and how we start really building some of that. Uh, and also uh, a lot of automation that is coming there. But at the human level, um, I think the most important piece are building trust and building relationships. Those are really the most important ones that I see come. Uh, is it possible that the coffee shops will not, sorry, this is Mal uh, Milani, uh saying, is it possible that the coffee shops will not have their businesses recovered because during the COVID-19 people that usually buy coffee will buy coffee machines instead and will continue making coffee for by themselves. And, and this is, is, is a great question, Melanie, but I, I, it depends what is the, the value prop proposition of the coffee shop. So if the coffee shop is simply does exist that you get that coffee, and by the way, um, Tim Horton and, uh, was declared like essential service. So it did not close during the COVID-19. So people continue to have their coffees uh, from, from these coffee shops. Uh, but I think I go, it goes back to what is the value proposition that you are making to the customer. If the customer think that coming to get their coffee, getting the experience, getting the connection and so on, uh, no, that will not be replaced by a machine. If the coffee is simply a commodity, yes, the machine can replace. And now we have very interesting machines that can make very, very good coffee. Uh, Don, do you see significant increase in digital economy in Canada in the next decade? Oh, wow. Uh, I think so. I think Canada is investing a lot, especially uh, in innovation. We have uh, the biggest artificial intelligence uh, research group is in Montreal. We have the digital cluster. We do have many kind of innovation that is happening in this area. And fortunately, I would say in Canada, compared to the US, we, we lack a, like the the government will and the investors will to take risks. And, and that is where, why you see a lot of good startups here in Canada, they move to the US uh, because in those first years we don't have it. But absolutely, I think um, there is actually a push for this and uh, you and I, we are working on, on this uh, digital twin supply chain um, uh, funded by, by the Canadian Research Council. Um, Iman. Very interesting webinar, thanks. Uh, do you think that business value definition will change with the last disruption of COVID-19? I am working on sustainable decision uh, using multi-criteria decision-making methods and seeing a huge change in sustainable definition and decisions. Uh, absolutely, I think we, even before, people forget that we had other urgencies before the COVID-19. We had the problem of the environment, the, the, the environment, and we had the problem of um, uh, the um, uh, inequalities. These were what we were talking about before COVID-19, and those did not go away. And this is why, if you go back to my at least talk, the way how I see it is, if we go back to this nesting idea that the economy is nested in the society and the society is nested in the environment. Uh, the, the corollary to that is we have to move to this kind of multi-stakeholders decision-making and engagement, which actually uh, militates toward the multi-criteria decision, and all the, sorry, the, the group and um, uh, collective decision-making. If uh, you accept from that that the value is multi-dimensional, that militates for the multi-criteria decision-making decision aid methods. 
And if we start really looking into this kind of long term, and then we start really talking about longitudinal dynamic systems rather than static and um, uh, and, 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 and frozen system. So I believe this will be the future and I see it by the way in terms of publication. Uh, the publication of multi-criteria decision analysis application to sustainability and, and this problem is going um, uh, uh, off the roof right now. Um, uh, Melanie, another question. So uh, if, uh, let me see how many you have. So I will get back to you Melanie because I would like to give uh, if we run out of time from uh, so closing long-term borders for non-essential travel, sorry, Olga, uh, closing long-term borders for non-essential travel definitely protects our health, considering that the workforce in the United States is getting sicker and can't work, um, and that most products in Canada come from the U.S., how could we, you know, how could we model or, and predict how products will come scarcer and uh, more expensive. It is a very interesting question, Olga, and I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> uh, the point is, yes, we have models, uh, and especially these type of problems, we cannot really model them simply by math. We need to start maybe thinking about uh, simulation and other type of tools really that can help us seeing how things can happen, for example, because you need to be able to model all the dynamics, but I don't believe that we will we'll get there. Um, I believe, first of all, uh, COVID-19 impact is kind of limited, even though that we have a lot of people dying and so on, and it's really, because it's really the sh on a short time, uh, but still actually people are recovering and most of the people recovers from, from the COVID-19. And uh, there are actually most of the organization they are finding part of their resiliency, they are, they are working on, on, on ways how they can um, uh, ad like, uh, address the shortages, for example, of workers and so on. Um, the other thing is you have um, uh, many countries in the world that are producers as well of the same, or they are competitors to what we are importing from the US. Uh, are, are not really experiencing the same kind of level of disruption. If we do uh, a projection that the U.S. will be disrupted um, dramatically, which I don't believe. Um, so then actually you start really thinking about the system like in, on a global basis. So yes, there will be probably an inflation, but it's not going to be that big because we see even now how fast things are really recovering except for some sectors like transport, air transportation or, or hospitality and so on, that will take a little bit of time. But most of the other sector, what I see, and again, um, I, as I said, it's, I, I, this is not my, expert, my expertise, so I'm trying to give you my layman kind of answer here. Um, it's not going to uh, uh, be impacted. Um, okay, going back to Melanie, because I think, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Melanie, from... Uh, as for diversification of supply, is it possible that the small players be eliminated soon due to the lack of competitiveness, so they will not be available when in demand? Uh, this is a great question, and I think um, I, I have seen it uh, playing the other way around. I have seen it, for example, if you have these big players, and uh, I have been working with on different problems with different people and different organizations. So even if we were to consider a big company in Canada, Sometimes on the, on the uh, global stage, they are not really as big compared, for example, to companies from the US or China or, or Europe. Uh, so sometimes even what you consider a big company in Canada, when they go and they try actually to source from outside the country, they get trouble and they are pushed actually uh, to the end of, of the line. I probably believe, and again, this is, this is just my, me thinking about this, at least from a rational perspective, and I know that the market is not rational. Uh, from a rational perspective, I would see opportunities for the small suppliers to play a bigger role because they can be more reliable, they can be more trustworthy, they can actually build a long-term relationships, uh, they can go beyond the, um, uh, the idea of transactions, so they are not competing just on the price and they can show that they can build a relationship for the long term. So I believe it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, we have five minutes, so I'm going to try to answer as much question I can. Um, still a few to go through. 
Um, so, um, Mackenzie, uh, great thoughts. Thank you. Um, for the context of building a tea company, uh, okay, tea is vulnerable to climate change and like coffee, uh, it takes advantage of cheap labor in countries where consistent products uh, imports can be challenging. Most people, sorry. So, yeah. Um, so most people go through in, 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 in intermediaries, but I want to work with tea estates. How do I build robustness and diversity into my supply chain? Uh, beyond diversity in, in suppliers and geographies, what advice would you share with someone? Okay, so I, I see where you're going with this. Um, I, again, it depends what is your value proposition to the customer. And I think in your case, I would see more a direct uh, sourcing strategy where you can combine and I can, if you'd like to email me, I can uh, dig a few, pay a few cases um, that I have seen related to coffee like this, where you have the coffee uh, distributor retailers in like you here, um, will develop direct relationship with farmers. But in that relationship, they try to create a win-win kind of a relationship. And by doing that, what they are creating, it is like similar to the cotton with IKEA. When you are developing some kind of really dedicated lines of products that will be coming to you, but at the same time, when I come and buy a coffee, uh, sorry, a tea from your, your shop, I am also contributing to sustaining and supporting a family in another country. So that is a very interesting kind of model, but it requires commitment. It requires quality. It requires also diversification because if you are, if you have only one farmer, for example, one channel, uh, and let's say for whatever reason, for the weather, whatever, the crop of that year is not good. So what you do about it? And, and this kind of long-term commitment uh, that goes both way and you will see when you start really building that relationship for the long term those farmers will be there for you when you need them and the same thing that they will see you as partner not necessarily as simply a customer uh, but please email me and i'm happy actually to go through some of these details with you um okay two last questions probably um lynn so how does one go about making an argument for sustainable sustainable business practice to those non-essential small businesses that are struggling with COVID challenges? And I think this is a great question. And I say to people, look, if you are a business, remember what I, say, I said about uh, um, the value creation. If you are not getting money to be able to fuel your business, uh, yes, you start thinking about, all what I'm talking about, like the sustainability, social responsibility as a luxury for the companies who are doing well. And, and that is a wrong thinking. I think it's really important when you start really thinking about this in the long term. So absolutely going through the crisis, trying actually to be able to work and, and stop um, the loss of money and start really like get, at least surviving. Um, like thinking about the long term is going to be a little bit kind of more harder, especially if you are if you don't have the money to do it. However, I would say there are a lot of opportunities to use this crisis to rethink the way how you do business. So I the way how I would use the argument is to use cases, and there are tons of cases. There are a lot of empirical cases, even for the smallest of the businesses when actually you start thinking differently and change the mindset probably in the beginning is not going to be comfortable but on, on the long run you are building something that will be resilient and, and robustness robust because think about your suppliers if your relationship with your supplier has been always positive and mutual support when you are going through difficult times your suppliers will help you i most of the companies today they are trying to help their suppliers survive the crisis. Uh, think about chocolate, think about cotton, think about uh, coffee and so on. So that when you are helping them going through the crisis, then they will be there for you when you go through the crisis. And that is 
the reality of how we do things, we actually stand up one for the other. And the only way how you can do it is building these positive relationships. Uh, Abdul Halim, if Canadian government start uh, thinking from cheaper supply chain uh, to more expensive one, what will happen to the low income customers? Does it increase social inequalities further? And this is another myth as well. When you start thinking about uh, competing on the cost, that is the only way how you can uh, drive uh, the prices down. And my argument I use in my classroom, I said to the students, if you start thinking in terms of competing using the price only, that is uh, a race to the bottom. You are racing to the bottom and that will not recreate opportunities. Think about coffee. Um, so we could actually thought about coffee as this kind of commodity that we need to get it the, the cheapest, the, the cheaper. And that was actually the, the story between, for example, I don't know, you are young, probably you don't remember that. We had uh, uh, like Tim Horton and we had uh, Dunkin' Donuts and we have all of these shops. The only one that survived that is a little bit now is Tim Horton. But what explains that we do have now other kind of chains of, of coffee or others, and not necessarily more expensive in their base kind of entry products. So the fact that you can start working on the long term, start working on the different dimensions, I would argue that will reduce normally the, uh, the cost, uh, because now you are working on sustainable uh, model. The second thing is you are going to be reducing your risk because you're going to be less exposed to all these different risks. So your cost of operating and so on could actually go down. And the third one is you see that your business does not only exist for money, but you have this kind of resp social responsibility. So you will be committed as a business to your social responsibility as well. So if we encourage, we're not saying more expensive supply chain, I'm saying more responsible supply chains, that will help creating an ecosystem of responsible businesses. All right, so I think I have, we went a little bit over time by three minutes, but thank you for all the questions, keep them. So if you have more questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, but I think this is the time that I turn it to the moderator. Thank you for your attention and thank you for attending.